God, I want to follow you, Lord, for this opportunity, the time we have to share together in unity as a family and as friends. Lord, it's been a trying time. We only have way through the week, Lord, and the devil's been busy. But Lord, we thank you that you have given us mercy and grace, and your precious blood has covered us and restored us. And now we have the opportunity right now to give thanks and praise unto you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, we ask right now that we break bread together tonight, that you will be in the midst and you will have your way. Touch the hearts of your people, Lord, because somebody is going through right now, Lord, and they need a word directly from you. And Lord, I believe what you gave in me is going to be able to set the captives free. So Lord, we glorify you right now for what you want to do tonight in this Bible study. So Lord, we honor you, and Lord, we ask that you honor us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the body of Christ say amen. Let's give the Lord a quick praise break, and we're going to get right into the word. Amen? Last week, we talked about the power and the oneness with Jesus Christ and his Father. The unity and the Father and the Son. Uh, St. John, chapter 17, 17, verse 11, was our foundation scripture. And here's the B part of it. It said, Jesus said, Father, make them one as we are one. Who is, who is he asked, Who is he saying to make one as Father and the Son are one? Uh, Jesus is talking about the believers, the followers of him, his disciples. That's what he's talking about. Keep them in the name that kept me. I don't know about y'all, but there is a name above every name that has been keeping us through danger, seen and unseen. St. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, it, it, it tells us about in this life, what we go through in this life, we're going to have some trials and tribulation. We're going to have some troubles. We're going to have some storms. But Jesus Christ said, be of good cheer because I have overcome. Because he overcame, we know that those who are connected with him can overcome any storm, any type of trial, tribulation we come through, God will give us the ability to be able to make it through if we stay connected to him. The power of the oneness. There is power in unity. The Bible says two are better than one. We can grow strength from one another if we learn how to unite with Christ first. Before we can unite with each other as the body of Christ, we have to know who it is we pattern after and what he represents and what was his purpose. Jesus prayed. We talked about the prayer of Jesus, his posture, his position. In this prayer, in uh, chapter 17, verse 1, it said Jesus was looking up. It wasn't a prayer of sorrow. It wasn't a prayer of defeat or agony. This was a, a prayer of victory and triumph where he was giving his father thanks and glory for keeping him thus far. And he said, he knew he was leaving to go home to be with the Father. And he said, Lord, as you have been with me, I need you to be with them. Keep them in the name, the name that kept me. Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, these were, the Bible is filled with great prayers, by the way. There's a lot of different prayers, of, uh, impressive prayers. One of them was uh, Solomon had a prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8. Please write this down. These are scriptures you can go back to and study a little bit later. But these are some great prayers. Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 8. Abraham's prayer in Genesis chapter 18. And Moses had a prayer in Exodus chapter 13. But this prayer that Jesus prayed was far better and far anointed than any other prayer that was ever prayed by any disciple, prophet, Major, minor, doesn't matter. King, it doesn't matter. This prayer that Jesus prayed, because he was praying in victory. He wasn't trying to call his father down and beg him or anything. He was thanking him. He said, Lord, now it's time for you to glorify me so I can glorify you. It's not that he hasn't been glorified the whole journey that he lived on this earth, opening blind eyes and, and, and causing the lame to walk. God was with him. God announced several times, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The Lord was with him when he was baptized by John the Baptist. He was led in the wilderness by the Spirit of God. He was tested and tempted by the, by the enemy. God was with him. But this prayer, 
There is no voice which has ever been heard, either in heaven or in, in the earth, more exalted, more holy, more fruitful, more beautiful than the prayer offered up by the Son to God himself, to Jesus, to his Father. Genuine prayer often reveals a personal innermost being of you. It shows you your character, who you really are. And Jesus was showing the oneness that he had with the Father. I know where I'm going here. We talked about the power, that power, the power. A genuine prayer. John chapter 17 is a unique opportunity to see the nature and the heart of Jesus Christ. If you want to see his heart, read chapter 17 and you'll see the heart of Christ. Being grateful for the ones that God had sent them. God had directed you wasn't no accident. God didn't have to come seeking for you. You were already chosen, according to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. He told Jeremiah, yeah, you're a prophet. Yeah, but before you was in your mother's womb, I knew you. Isn't that that's good news? I don't know about y'all, but isn't it good to be known by God? Isn't it good to be known that no matter what we see, no matter what obstacles we run across in life, no matter how bad it looks, no matter how bad the tragedy in your life, that God had a plan for you and a purpose. He said, before you were in your mother's womb. Somebody said, well, you talking about Jeremiah. I, I beg to differ. But before you were in your mother's womb, God knew you. He, he placed you in a position where you are right now. Somebody said, well, the question was asked that, how can we get on one accord? How can God's people get on one accord? Like at first, you got to see how God and the Father, the Son and the Father was connected as one before we can connect as one. We must co co first connect with Jesus Christ. The title of the class is called One Accord. One Accord, united with Christ we stand. Not with the world, not with your family, not with your job. United with Christ we stand. Because there's no better hands to be with or no other partner to be in unity with other than Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ will make that marriage better. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Jesus Christ, united with Christ will bring you healing. United with Christ, oh yeah, will bring deliverance. He will come right down the aisle and right where you are when we learn how to be united with Christ. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a few different things here. I want to uh, back up a little bit. Keep them in the name. The name. The name which you have given me. There's some names of God that I want to go through real quick. It's not really a part of the class, but just good information. Good information. Knowledge is power. Yahweh. God was called Yahweh. Yahweh meaning Lord God. Uh, Adonai, Adonai, meaning Lord God, Master. Elohim, meaning Father God, God of creation, Genesis chapter 1. Abba, I mean Father. Jehovah, Rapha, the Lord who heals. The Lord who heals. Jehovah Shalom, Lord is my peace. Anybody need some peace? When Jesus was talking to his father in chapter 17. He was saying, everyone that you gave me, everyone that you have given unto me as an assignment to lead them, guide them, protect them, minister to them, build them up, be an example for them. He said, I lost none of them. Because I believe sometime in their life, these disciples and followers of Christ, they ran into this God name right here, the name that kept Christ. He said, I didn't come to do the will, my will, but I come to do the will of him who sent me, his father. And the other name of, of God, Jehovah Ebenezer. God is my helper. Have you ever needed some help? Yahweh, Jehovah, God, my helper, my peace, my banner, Jehovah Nisi, my banner. Exodus chapter 17 15, verse 15 to 16. Come on. We'll, we'll get back to the one. I'm talking about the one that's right now. Because this God, the name that Jesus had to walk in and, 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 and to honor and to listen and to fellowship with, had power. It had meaning. Uh, Jehovah my banner. Excuse me. Jehovah Nisi. Lord my banner. Exodus chapter 17, 
Verse 15 tells us, Moses built an altar, altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. Because when they was fighting against the Amalekites, it was the Lord's mighty hand that stood up against the Amalekites, the enemy. Are you going through anything? Are you going through any trials or tribulations when the enemy is coming after you and you don't know which way to turn? You need to know your God is Je Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. I, if I can stay there for a moment, I got testimony behind testimony. I know you do. How many times God provided when your back was against the wall? You had no finance to be able to pay your bill, and somehow God made a way out of no way. But it was only because of the connection that the father and son had. Yeah, it's a blessing in the Old Testament, what they call God. He is still that God to us today. Jehovah, Jireh, my provider. Jesus was depending on him because they were one. Jesus was telling them in the book of St. John, chapter 17, uh, verse 11, Lord, make them one as we were one. And solidarity and unity. And step. Anything you ask me to do, I've done it out of obedience. Even when it came time to the obedience of death of the cross, he was obedient even unto death. Can I get an amen? We talked about the power. Verse 1, it said, Jesus spoke to them. He raised up his eyes to heaven in prayer. He said, Father, my hour has come. Glorify that son. We talked about that. Verse 2, I want to stop here for a moment. Just as you have given me power and authority over all mankind, now I glorify him so that he may give eternal life to all who you have given him. Think about that for a moment. Jesus Christ said, give them eternal life, everlasting life with me, everlasting life with you. We talked about with the oneness of Christ. We said his assignment was ending. When Jesus Christ came to do on the cross, it was coming to a close. But when he went home with the Father, he tagged in with the Holy Spirit. We talked about that. He tagged in with the Holy Spirit was coming. And he came here, but he was coming after the death of Christ. Holy Spirit was coming that was going to live on the inside of us. But one thing I just want you to let you know, that the finished work of Christ wasn't quite finished because he's still working today, even in glory. The Bible says he's sitting on the right hand of the Father, making an intercessory, intercession for us. He's still interceding on us. When we make mistakes, when we don't know, know what to pray for, when we on our knees and we, we moan and groan, and say that the Holy Spirit takes up the others, give, a, give a clear understanding to the Father of what we really mean and what we're going through. In your midnight hour when you're hurting so bad and all you can say is, hmm, a Lord have mercy on me because you have a oneness with Christ because he chose you and you've been selected by God you have something to praise God for you have a testimony you have a, you're a live witness you're a demonstration for the world and that's how we become in one step in unity with Christ united with Christ we stand to whom all you have given him to be his permanent, permanently, and forever. Those who have truly accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a permanent home and relationship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But you have to do what Christ did. Christ accepted his assignment. He lined up with his assignment. He took on whatever challenges came his way. He didn't run and hide. He was obedient. And then when his assignment was over, he still was interceding for us. Lord, all the ones you gave me, I lost none. Lost none. What did he do? He didn't have to come looking for us. We were in his mind. We were in the mind of Christ. In the beginning, we were in the mind of God. In the beginning, he knew exactly what the plan was for our life. And tonight we're going to be talking about the purpose. The purpose. The purpose. What is our purpose? What was Christ's purpose? The Bible tells us clearly that the purpose of Christ 
and um, chapter 19. Excuse me, St. John, chapter 19, verse 10. He said, I come to do the will of him who sent me. And he talks about that he came to seek and to save those who are lost. In this chapter, chapter that I'm referring to, it talks about the first verse to talk about Zacchaeus. Me and Zacchaeus had something in common. We were both tall men. We were tall. We were tall and stacked. No, no, I'm just kidding. Zacchaeus was a little short man, and, I, and I, you know, like me, short in stature, but he was a tax collector. I, I need you to hear this because this chapter really demonstrates the oneness with Christ and how much he loved us and how he was setting an example. He was painting a picture for us and letting you know what Christ done to choose us. We didn't choose him. We didn't, we didn't wake up one morning and said, I want to be saved. He chose us. Not only did he chose us, he ordained us. He put us in a position where we can learn to trust him and we can get fed by the word of God. You ought to be thankful for the church home that you had. If you got a pastor to preach the word, you need to be thankful for the word that's being taught, being spoken to your spirit, because this is what we need to survive. The word of God. The Bible says, heaven and earth shall pass away. Everything else will cease. But the word of God is going to last for eternity. And we got to know that we've been, we've been bought with a price. A heavy price. Christ shed his blood for all of us. For the remission of sin. He said, what was the purpose? The purpose was, we found in that verse, he said, I come to seek and to save. 19, chapter 19, verse 10. I came to seek and to save those who are lost. If I could take my time here, Jesus was showing an example of what his purpose was here on earth. He was sent for no other reason. He said, I was sent to do the will of him who sent me. He was talking about his father. His father had a plan. He had a plan to be able, he wanted to have fellowship back with his people. And the thing is, God knows exactly who his people is. Because in chapter 17, it talks to Lord, I thank you for the ones you gave me. I didn't lose not one. But the son of prediction, we're talking about Judas. Judas was the one. He called Judas a devil in the beginning. But if you've been called and selected by God, you've got so much to be thankful for. Because you were on your way to hell. Your loved ones was on their way to hell. But God stopped by. He said a word. His word. He said his word. And the word healed them. And delivered them and set them free. God already had the plan. You were out there getting high. You were doing like I was. Getting out there drinking. Doing everything I was big and bad enough to do. But one day the word came forth. Before the class started, the job was playing the, uh, uh, Kirk Franklin and uh, Rance Allen. It's something about the name Jesus. It's something about that name Jesus. There's power in that name. There's resurrection power. There's something that can convert you, change you, restore you, give you strength, give you hope, give you light, give you the ability to be able to make a change in other people's lives. Jesus came to make a change. He said, I came to seek and to save those who are lost. Zacchaeus got into a high place. He heard that Jesus was coming. There was a press, and he couldn't see, but he heard about it. He was a tax collector. He was hated by many. He robbed people. <laughs> he, he was famous. He was famous for the line to get his behind kicked because all the wrong he'd done to people. But when he heard the name Jesus, talk about the oneness now, and about the calling, how God called you. He had a plan for Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus said, I'm not going out to get drunk tonight. I'm not going to collect any taxes. I'm climbing up in a tree so I can see Jesus. The risen Savior. He didn't know about the risen Savior yet, but he was going to get to know him. Because Jesus had already selected him. He said, come down. He spotted Zacchaeus. Not by accident. Not because a tree, that sycamore tree was the only sycamore tree around. I imagine there was more people in the tree wanting to see Jesus. But it was something about Zacchaeus. It was a heart. We talked about the prayer 
Abraham and Solomon and all. There was all good prayers. The prayer of David, who was called the apple of God's eye. I wonder what was in that prayer. We heard about David praying, creating me a clean heart and renewing me a right spirit. It's something about when you get sincere through your prayer. There's power in your prayer. But there also there's power in your purpose. Zacchaeus had a, had a purpose. And Jesus sought him out. You ought to stop right now and give God praise for seeking you out. All the, all the billion people in the world, God stopped by and chose you. I'm excited about this tonight. I know I might be going a little fast. Please forgive me. But you will catch up. In this word of God, he stopped by and calls the kids down. He said, today, I'm going to your house. Do you remember when he said, today, I'm coming to your house? Chapter 19, you got to read it. And when you read it, take your time. Because there's so much meat in there. He said, I'm coming to your place. And guess what? Others heard it. And guess what they began to say? They said, Jesus going to a sinner's house. What is Christ's purpose? In order to find out what your purpose is, you've got to see Christ's purpose. God is showing. Jesus is showing us his purpose. He came. I came to seek and to save those who are messed up, like the kids. Put your messed up situation in the kids. The kids must have realized that he was doing wrong. Because I don't think he'd have ever even attempted to seek Jesus. Even though the scripture said, no man coming to the Father unless he's first drawn. We know about that power being drawn. Ain't no accident you came to the church and Pastor happened to be preaching on something that you were going through. Man, there might have been an emotional moment, because we do go through emotional roller coasters, especially when there's a death. I, re I remember back in 1997 when my brother Michael passed away. He was murdered. If you, you're talking about pain, when you see TV when people get murdered, we watch it on the news, and you feel compassion for them from that moment when they said, oh, my loved one's gone, they're crying, they, their heart is heavy, and they're pouring out their tears and heart to the situation. You feel compassionate for a moment, but after a while, you're going about your day until it comes to your house. One day, some heavy pain came to our house when my brother was pronounced dead and he was murdered. That was one of the most chilling moments in my life. It was a wake-up call in my life. But God, through Jesus Christ, and the union they had together, gave me the strength, gave our family the strength to hold together and make it through that rough time. And I remember that the family was coming together. My dad was in Florida at the time, and the family was coming together. We met at my house, and, and I remember calling my dad in Florida and, and telling him, and he said that the Holy Spirit had already revealed to him what had happened, okay? Didn't pay no mind. Hey, as long as dad cool, we know about it. Went to praying and receiving. And what happened later, after the death of my brother, we losing my hero, somebody I admired and I looked up to, was gone. But through that pain, God was able to bring our family together. And at the funeral, Pastor Duncan, my senior pastor, he preached the funeral at Crusaders of Christ, and 42 people came up for salvation. 42 people. I know where I'm going. I don't, 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 don't change the channel. I know where I'm going. 42 people got saved. What I'm talking about, sometimes when you're hurting, your emotions can get in the way where, really, you're vulnerable for anything. But God didn't have those people there by accident. And that because there was a union between the Father and the Son, and the Son and our pastor, and he was preaching the word of God, 42 people came up and gave their life to the Lord. He said, how can God turn a bad situation and stuff to something good? When 42 souls got rescued from going to hell, and, and the ones that I see now that gave their life, they're still in church serving the Lord. But do I believe all of it? Sometimes our emotions can get in the way. But when God called you, when Jesus Christ called you and select you, the devil in hell cannot pluck you out of his hands. The word of God tells us that very plainly. 
back to Zacchaeus. It was the church folks. It wasn't the world. It was the church folks that said, they said, Jesus is going to a sinner's house. That is not unity. That is called disunity. If you're wondering why churches are struggling today, you, if you're wondering why there's no healing in the house of God or with God's people, it could be because we're so disunified. We're not on one accord. We're not in union with Christ. Christ did so. He said, I came for that reason. I came for the ones that you said ain't no hope for. I came for the ones who were robbing and stealing from other people because I seen something in their heart. Like David, create in me a clean heart, David said, and renew in me a right spirit. Because I know my spirit is not right. You're not crazy when you do stuff that don't line up with God's word. Being saved. All I'm telling you is you need to do what David did. If God called him the apple of his eye, after all the mess that David did, had somebody killed and took somebody's wife, and, did, and he still called the apple, what did, what did David do right? David stayed in unity with God. When his sins were pointed out to him by Nathan, David got back in line and repented. He stayed in step. He stayed in solidarity with God, his God. God who provides. God, my banner. One will make a way out of no way. The great I am. Jesus asked his son, who do you say, who did people say that I am? I am. He was demonstrating again, and we couldn't see it, because God will only reveal to his people the revelation of his word. Especially in the times that we live in right now. Um, I was watching the news, and, and it, it, it's so ironic that the Lord had me teaching on the oneness with Christ in on one accord, with all the hell that we're going through in the world, with Russia and Ukraine. But can you look and see what's really going on, how countries are starting to unify and support a little small area like Ukraine when Russia is so large? I heard one of the priests and rabbis say, it's almost like David and Goliath. David being a little shepherd boy, and Goliath this big giant. He said that if we stay connected and we begin to intercede and pray and stay in unity with God and the Father who he has sent, he came to seek and to save those who are lost. If the church folks, if the believers of God, the, the redeemed, the Bible says that the redeemed of the Lord says, any redeemed out there? Yeah, I'm talking to you. I'm in your home. I'm talking to you right now. Is there any redeemed? If we can learn to get on one accord and touch and agree and pray and bind that spirit, and change, turn from our wicked ways. According to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, if my people, the one that I call, the one that I selected, would turn from their wicked ways. Zacchaeus didn't know what to expect, but Jesus knew what exactly what his purpose was going to be. My purpose is to seek the hurting, the loss. He said, I'm going home. I know I'm jumping around. Chapter 17, he said, I'm going home. Verse 11, uh, excuse me, chapter 17, verse 11. He said, I'm going home to be with you, Heavenly Father, a Holy Father. He said, but just like you was with me in this world, I need you to be with them. In the name that you've given me, and the name that kept me and provided and protected me, I need you to be there with me. And I need you to make them one as we as one. Don't, don't miss that. I'm talking about the purpose. The kids, chapter 19, verse 10. So I come to seek and to save those are lost. And then Jesus went right into a parable. Read it for yourself. I'm powerful. I'm jumping around, but I'm trying to make a point. Jesus gave a parable. Because they couldn't understand what Jesus was saying. Because they didn't have a full understanding of who he really was. They didn't know him as the Son of God. They didn't know him as the, the, the risen Savior. The uh, marriage baby. They, they didn't know him as that. They looked at him as a carpenter. But it wasn't talking about he gave out talents. What is my purpose? 
What is, our, what is Christ's purpose? We see Christ's purpose. Came to seek and save those who lost. What is our purpose? According to Scripture, demonstrated in this parable. He said, a noble man, a noble man was going to be honored as a king, but he was coming back. And he grabbed his servants and told them, I gave them some money, gave them three months wait. He gave some of them ten, he gave one ten, one five, and one one town. Gave them gifts. Gave them gifts. He knew them. He knew them. Just like he knew his disciples. Just like he knew the son of perdition. But he knew he was a devil. He gave them. This is the parable. I, I, I'm trying to show you the, the, the uh, uh, comparison. As he was talking, he gave them talents. And he said, I need you to invest. He, he gave them instruction what he wanted them to do. The one had ten. Went and invested. The one that had five went and invested. He'd done something with the gift that God gave him. I'm talking to somebody tonight. God gave us something. He told us what he wanted us to do. He gave us an example by his instruction, what he did, his demonstration, how he showed love. He showed you what it came for. And he gave them the gift to invest it. The one that had ten invested it. The one that had five invested it. But there was one who was afraid because he said the noble man was a hard man. And he was afraid. And when the noble man came back and he seen the one that had ten. I'm moving right along because I gotta get to I gotta get to the scripture I want to get to. And the one that had ten invested, he said, I'm going to give you ten more. I'm going to give you ten more prophets to take care of. The one who gave five. Bless it. He said, I'm going to give you five more prophets to take care of. When he got to the one. The one said, I was afraid, not buried. You told me what to do. I was afraid. You were hard. And he gave me this trust. He said, I'm going to take from you, and I'm going to give it to somebody else to know what to do with the gift that I gave them. Question I have for you tonight. Believers of God, saints of God, children of God, co-laborers of the Lord, what have you done with the gift that God gave you? Are you still wrestling with, am I connected with God? Am I in one step with God? There's many chapters in the Bible that can confirm your relationship with God, but you have to believe. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. It says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Like I said, God knew exactly what he was doing. He knew you before you was in the mother's room. He predestined you to be conformed into the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, predestined, them he also called. But those who he had called, to them he also justified. You didn't have to do nothing but believe. All you had to do is go out there and invest. And he told the one that was afraid. He said, all you had to do, if you were afraid, put that in the bag and let it draw interest. You didn't have to do much. Your brother and sister's unsaved. All you had to do was tell them to tune in to Facebook. Go live. Watch Shallow Baptist. Watch another church, who, a Bible-believing church, and preaching the gospel. You won't even do that. As believers, we always want to tell people what they should be doing in church, out of church, in a home. But when the enemy rises up his ugly head with COVID, we run and hide. God gave us gifts. He gave us talents. And he said, use what I gave you. Because I put my anointing on it. And when I put my anointing on it, whenever you speak, whenever you touch, whenever you walk, whenever you go, he said, I'll be with you. I promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you feel abandoned, I'm still there. COVID came and ran and hid. We buried our gift. We said, I'm afraid. I don't want to use it. You had an opportunity to put a mask on and come to church. I'm not, I'm not arguing with you or, or saying you were wrong for not coming. But you wouldn't even push the button on Facebook and hit, hit like and share to be able to pass the gospel on. You didn't have to preach it. All you had to do was pass it on to somebody that might be hurting. 
But you chose not to do that. You chose to hide. You'll give and bury it because you were afraid. God don't expose people who don't like being in front of the camera or don't like having a mic. He had, he had a purpose for them as well. But it's something you can do. Jesus came and he said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. Today, salvation has come to your house. He said, this is the son of Abraham. Speaking of Abraham, like I said, I was watching the news. And it was a Christian channel. And it was a, a, a man of God. I liked some of the stuff he was saying, but I didn't agree with all of it. Because I think he forgot about the finished work of Christ that we're talking about here. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not a prophet and don't claim to be and don't want to be. I believe in prophecy. There's prophecy. I believe there's prophecy. I do believe that. But I also know the word of God. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, God said he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I believe that whether you do or not. I don't try to add no strings. I don't try to add no smokes and screens with that. I believe what it says. And I believe once I accepted his son Jesus, and you, when you accepted his son Jesus, we're no longer alienated from the gospel, from the truth, from the blessing. And I do know, Israel, anybody who come up against Israel, if you curse Israel, you're going to be cursed. If you bless Israel, you're going to be blessed. But because I accepted Jesus, and because I accepted the finished work, and he chose me, and I'm one of the ones that, that's in his hands and can't be plucked out because I'm still wrapped up in the Father's hand, the devil and anybody else, the enemy can't pluck me out. Guess what? You and I both, we are entitled to the blessing of Abraham. So when somebody curse me, they're going to be cursed. When somebody curse you, they're going to be cursed. Somebody bless you, they're going to be blessed. We were leaving. We cannot leave people out who made up their mind to accept the power of God. We have to accept their purpose in God. They take up that bloodstained banner. And they walk and march in unity and solidarity with their Savior. Meaning, Jesus Christ is no longer here. But he left us something on the inside. So when we speak, when we walk, when we talk, there's evidence. There's proof that Jesus lives in us. Still making intercession for us. He's still up there with the Father. Speaking on our behalf. That's something to give God praise for. Can you say ah, hallelujah right now? Say hallelujah, baby. My wife is here again with me tonight. My road dog, she with me. I love her to death. My daughter's here too. Predestined. Ah, to predetermine or foreordain, to appoint or to ordain beforehand by an unchangeable purpose. Ephesians chapter 1 Verse 11, it says, In whom also we have attained an inheritance, <laughs> being predestinated according to the purpose. Here's the purpose. When I told the purpose, the purpose of being in unity, there is a purpose. The purpose is, Jesus' purpose was, I came to do the will of him that sent me. I come to seek and to save those who lost. So if that's his purpose, he gave us a demonstration. He gave us an example of what we should do. Then it's very easy what our purpose is. Our purpose is to do the will of him who saved us. Do the will of him who died on the cross for us. Who, who shed his precious blood for us. If we do his will, if we do uh, follow his instructions, his statute, his commandments, we don't have to worry about losing our seat in the kingdom. Because just like he said in chapter 17, he told us that we are permanently, permanently his. Meaning there is no erasing of names. Those who are being called by God and accepted his son are permanently his. That's something to be thankful for. 
being predestinated, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. The unity with the Father and Son. His own will. He came to do the will of him who sent me. And he was already in unity because they are one. In the beginning, he knew what the purpose was. He knew what his purpose was. He knew that except who to accept him, he knew what our purpose was. Now, our job is to exercise the gift, to invest the gift that God has given us. I, I'm hoping I'm not putting anybody to sleep, but you ought to be thankful if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you can still hear the voice of God speak, you ought to be thankful. If, if you got a roof over your head, you got clothes on your back, and you, you can come, you got a, a choice where you can go fellowship and worship at, you need to be thankful unto God. There's some people that with this dictatorship with the, the Russian president want to be the dictate, tell people when to do it, when not to do it, or take things away from them. We have a, a, we have a God that's full of peace and liberty. And he said, we lack in anything. Uh, James chapter 1. If a man is lacking wisdom, let him ask of God. We got access and connection to no matter what we're going through, that God would give us the provision. He will make a way and provide for us to be able to accomplish any assignment, any task that laid ahead of us. Yes, I'm talking about those tasks when you don't lost somebody that you love. I'm talking when you don't lost your job. I'm talking about when you're sick and don't seem like you're going to get well. You still have hope in Christ Jesus. Because he knew, he called you according to the will and the counsel of his own will. Verse 12 in Ephesians chapter 1, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who's first trusted in Christ. Jesus' purpose was to unite us together. Please write these scriptures down. The New Testament tells us that Jesus had an ongoing present work of intercessory for his people. He was constantly doing it. It was in heaven. Romans chapter 8 and Hebrews 7.25. Write that down. Romans chapter 8, verse 34, and Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. The object being not so much to let us know what he said on a special occasion as to show the constant attitude of his mind. That's what we want to look at. The constant attitude of his mind. He was constantly thinking about us. The informing idea of his unceasing and accessory prayer for us during the time of his absence. In his absence, he still interceded for us. Didn't leave us alone, left us comfort in the Holy Spirit. Always got us on his mind. There's this thing called uh, fear. Fear that traps. I remember one time I was going through something, uh, and I, I remember praying, and the Lord said, he said, everybody have this thing called fear that every now and then raises his ugly head in us. We don't like to talk about it. It's something that makes you trigger a tremble in your spirit, man, when it comes to you, or when it's in your presence. This thing called fear. And what it does, and what it does, is trying to take residence where the Holy Spirit abides in the believers. So what it does, it tucks its way in the corner. And it waits for its opportune time for it to jump out. When you're going through a financial situation, you always panic about, Lord, how am I going to make a way? How am I going to get through this? How am I going to make it this time? And I realize God just brought you through 11 other times. This fear can make you forget about all the blessings that God has stored for you. When you prayed over your kids and they, they, they got well. When, 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 you need, when you need some help, you need a, a spouse. God, God provided you with a spouse. Uh, you, you needed a house, he provided you with a house. And then that fear comes along and, and here you go back. You, you let that fear come out and take control anytime and get ready. Because the Holy Spirit is waiting for you to connect with the Word. And to stand strong and be able to open your mouth and be able to give, give, give orders to that fear and bind it in the name of Jesus. You forget the authority that he gave you. Christ died that you might have authority over the enemy and over your flesh. I know, it's, I know this flesh can be wicked. This flesh don't want anything good. 
We know that. But because we're not in step in unity and solidarity with each other, we're afraid to even co confess or confront those rough moments when our flesh gets in trouble. Oh, we can't tell nobody about our flesh. Oh, we don't want people to think we're not holy. But how do you think people are going to get through it if they're wrestling and believers who've been through it? God brought you out. You're taking the gift that God gave you, which is the Word of God, which is His fellowship, the union with Him, and you refuse to open your mouth and tell somebody how you made a way, how God brought you out. I, 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 I just don't understand it. And then again, I do. Fear. Fear can hold you hostage and say, if I go to telling people about what I did, what are they going to think about me? Hmm. How are they going to view me? Will they even listen to me? Let me go on. Jesus is always speak, speaking and representing others. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says, who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. It's not Christ that condemns. He said, I didn't come to this world to condemn. I came to this world that might be saved. Who is it that condemns? So don't look at it like that. It, said, it is Christ. Somebody changing the narrative. It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that he that rose again. It was him that rose too. Who is even at the right hand at the, of the Father, who is also making intercessory for us. I just want to give you a scripture to back up what I was saying. A lot of times we say a lot of words, but you need to know what the scripture says. What Jesus Christ's role is. Intercessory for you. Interceding. Representing you. Speaking on your behalf. Taking up for you. Protecting you. To God the Father. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, by the Son, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession, an intercessory for them, for us. Please write those scriptures down. I just want to tell somebody a story uh, about my childhood. And it kind of relates to what we're talking about because when you find out what your purpose is, there's some assignments that might be given to you that might hurt. Jesus might ask you to go to somebody that don't like you. And it might feel pretty painful. But he will carry you through it. And I was thinking, you know, my mom passed away when I was 14 years old. But I remember this one story that I was... I was old enough to feel embarrassed. Uh, we was going back to school, and you know, those are you know from the south or either you know country folks like myself. Uh, they normally give you medicine before you go back to school. This medicine called Black Draw Six Six Six. Some horrible medicine to give you, kind of flush you out, get you ready for school. And um, school was coming up that following week, and uh, we was out there playing in the yard, and my mom seen me cause boy, get in there and take a bath. I was around uh, 8 and 10, somewhere in there. Like I said, I was old enough to feel embarrassed. She was going in and, and, and take a bath. You dirty, boy. She spotted some dirt on me. She told me to go in there and wash. And I went in there and washed, but I half washed. I know where I'm going, y'all. I half washed. But because she loved me, and I represented her, she seen something on me that shouldn't have been on me. But all it do is take a little work to get off. Just like Christ loved us. He's seen something on us. He chose us. He selected us. But sometimes you got to get that, that cleaning, that rag. You got to get that scrubber brush. And you got to scrub. I remember mom scrubbing me so hard. <laughs> I, I can laugh now. I wasn't laughing then. Out. You know, somebody here, somebody... For instance, somebody said to beat the black off of you. Well, she washed the black off of me. When I, she got done washing me, that water was black. And what she did, she showed me that water. She said, look, this was on you.
Sometimes we don't realize the sin that was on us. Sometimes we don't realize how bad a shape we were really in. But Christ loved us so much that he grabbed us and told us to go back in there and watch. But when you go back in there and watch, I'm going to watch you this time. I'm going to make sure that you're clean because you belong to me and I belong to you. You represent me. When you go out there and you take up the gift that I gave you and you go to exercise in that gift, you represent me. And I need to make sure you're clean. I need to make sure everything's clear around you. So when you speak, they don't see you, they see me. Because you represent me. That water was so dirty. I felt embarrassed because I could have cleaned it myself. But I could have never gotten it as clean as my mother got. Because she was on the outside looking in. Christ is on the outside looking in. He know who you are. He know where you've been. He know how dirty you have gotten. And he still chose to get in the tub. My mom didn't just wash me from the outside. She shot her feet. She pulled up her skirt. And she sat on the end of that tub. And she took time to clean me. To wash me. Put some pressure on me. It was heavy. It hurt at that time. But she kept telling me how much she cared about me. And she loved me. The more the story is, sometimes God got to wash you. Sometimes it's going to hurt. But I wouldn't be where I am tonight, standing before you, if I didn't get washed by somebody that loved me. Christ loved us. He made a choice to shed his precious blood because he loved us. God knew us. He selected us. He drew us. St. John chapter 6 verse 42 said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. His love, his connection, his oneness with God the Father is going to make us connect with him. He said, Lord, make them one as we are one. We're so close together that we are exactly alike. The reason why we struggle to hold our rightful place as believers in God is because we don't think we can do it. And you're right. We can't do it without his help. Tonight, in my closing, you can get that help and that strength you need if you truly connect with Jesus Christ. Yeah, we know the Holy Spirit lives in us. And the three are one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is one. But in order to be connected, you have to believe in all three. You have to believe in the Creator. That he created all things. He is the great I Am. You heard the Jehovah names that I mentioned. It's so many other more more names of God. The Almighty, the All-Seeing, the All-Knowing, the One who created the heavens and the earth. And because there was a disconnect when sin came into the world, we were separated from Him. Generations went by, kings, leaders, judges, came through, but they couldn't reunite us back together until He sent Himself. It's like God himself peeled off a piece of him and said, go in the form of my son. The union they had together and the Holy Spirit that he left for his believers to lead and guide you into all truth. We cannot understand the truth by leaving the Father's work, I mean the Son's work, the finished work of Christ out. That is the key ingredients. St. John chapter 14, verse 6. The Bible talks about, let not your heart be troubled, believe me not, believe also me. And my father, I'll mention man, we will stuff. He said, But Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to my father 
unless they first come to me. If you don't know that, if you haven't seen that in your word, you don't truly have a oneness with God and one with the Father. And you can never have a oneness with the body of Christ until you first accept that. Romans chapter, I'm not, let me move on, get past that. You do not stand in the gap for something that you don't love. You do not sacrifice your life for something you don't love. My mom demonstrated, but I, you know, I laughed about it, and somebody probably laughing about it too. Uh, she, scrubbed it, she scrubbed the dirt off of you, but she did it because she cared. She did it because she loved me. She did it because I represented her. She did it because I was her son. I want to talk to the young people as I close here. Young people, we haven't forgotten. Don't let the world and social media speak some nonsense into your spirit thinking that the church and the body of Christ and leaders don't understand you. I, 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 can, I can confess here boldly when I was young, I used to say the same thing. But I didn't have these different views that we have now. We got all these different opinions about everything on social media, Facebook, TikTok, all these different ideas and views of things. Our parents, they loved the Lord. They loved us. And they did the best they can. And at, at that time, when I was young, I made an excuse. I can't talk to my parents. They don't understand. I, said, I tried that. But when I got older, Paul said when I was a a child, I spoke as a child. I acted as a child when I became a man. I put away childish things. Once you get the word, you get an understanding. Once you get in unity and one accord with Jesus Christ, then you can be in unity with your brother and sister. I used to excuse, oh, oh, they don't understand me. But the thing is, I wasn't ready to receive what they had been telling me all along. Watch out for danger. Follow order. Follow leadership. You take it in the world, but you don't want to take it in church. Young people, I want to let you know, Shama, we love you. We're here for you. Speak, but don't be afraid of instructions, because the Word of God is our lifeline, is, is our instruction. He taught us through example how to be one, how to be in unity, through power, through purpose. And next week, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the benefits that come with oneness. Come back. I'm excited about our last class. Come back with us. We love you. God bless you. Until we meet again, I'm Pastor Gary Mack. Remember, one accord, united with Christ, we stand. God bless you.